Hey kiddos, welcome back to Running Wild. We are on chapter 12, so here we go. In the morning, we squeeze one by one out of the snow shelter door. The sky is gray, swirled with dark clouds, but the snow has stopped falling and the gale has lessened to a breeze. We overnighted in a sparse forest. Broken tree branches, covered with snow, litter the ground. I pick up a stick and crack it in half. The wood is still autumn dry. Where is Zoa? Seth asks. I heard him leave the shelter earlier, Keith says. The quiet warmth of our snow fort caused us to sleep late. It's just as well. We needed the rest. Zo! Seth cups his hands around his mouth as he calls. The wolf pup comes running through the trees and sits at Seth's feet. Blood reddens the fur around his mouth. You're right, Willa, Seth calls out. He does know how to hunt. Good boy. At least someone got a meal, I say. A snowshoe hare bounds by our camp. Its coat is half dusky brown, its summer color, and half white, its winter color. Zoa shoots out after the hare. Still hungry, I guess, Seth says. We all are. We need food if we're to continue. I'm going to try to get us a ptarmigan for breakfast, I tell my brothers as I fill the pockets of my parka with rocks from beside the creek. Build a fire. But you don't have a gun, Keith says. You worry about getting a fire going, I say. Look under the trees where there will be dry kindling. There hasn't been enough snow yet this year to soak the wood. I know how to find dry wood any time of year, Keith says. Prove it then. Seth begins clearing a patch of ground for the fire, and I set out into the woods, trying to remember exactly what Dad told me about hunting ptarmigan without a firearm. Like the snowshoe hares, ptarmigan are brown in the summer and white in the winter. Now, between the two seasons, they have feathers of both colors. Year-round, they forage for seeds and buds, so they tend to sit on branches close to the ground. They're big birds with dim brains. Back when Dad had a sense of humor, he joked that they look like they're trying to figure out where they are. There are plenty of ptarmigan in Alaska. I see one right away. The difficult part will be killing it. They don't even know to be afraid, Dad told me. They don't fly away if you approach slowly. All you have to do is throw a rock at their heads and knock them out. The problem is ptarmigan are tiny heads. You have to have good aim. You also have to be strong. The rock needs to at least stun the bird. I stand very still and size up my prey. Just as Dad said, it sits there on its tree branch, oblivious. I stalk a few steps closer. Sit it, still it sits, blinking its beady little eyes. Careful to make no sudden movements, I reach into my pocket and close my fingers around a rock. I withdraw it and cock back my arm. The ptarmigan fluffs up and looks around. I fire the rock with all my might. It sails a foot to the right of the ptarmigan's head and the bird flaps away. I soon find another ptarmigan and this time my rock hits the bird right in the chest, making a little thud. Even if my throw had hit the bird in the head, it wouldn't have been hard enough. Discouraged and suddenly more exhausted than I've ever felt in my life, I lean against a tree trunk and want to just give up. Willa! Seth's voice snakes through the cold air, through the tree branches to my ears. He sounds as if he's miles away, not just a couple of hundred yards. But I hear him, my sweet little brother, my charge, along with my other cross little brother. I push off the tree trunk. And follow my own tracks back to our camp. The boys have made a blazing fire. The sight of those hot flames give me a jolt of strength. I sure wish I had a charm again to cook on them. Seth warns me as I approach. Keith stands next to a tree, holding the tattered food bag. Seth grips the cool end of a stick from the fire and uses the burning end to soften the pitch on the tree trunk. He uses another stick to scrape up a glob of the gooey hot pitch. He paints the inside of the food bag with the pitch. Okay, Seth says. Put them in. Keith takes some needles, buds, and catkins from his pockets. He puts these in the food bag, now sticky with pitch. Ptarmigan's favorite snacks. But what'll make them eat the ones you collected instead of just getting their own? A big pile in one place is a lot better than having to peck all around the forest, Seth whispers. The ptarmigan's feathers will stick in the pitch, Keith speaks loudly, enthusiastic about his brother's inventiveness. It won't be able to get out. If we're lucky, I say, feeling doubtful. Seth says again, keep your voices down. You'll scare them away before we even set up the trap. We have to put this near the fire so the pitch stays sticky, Keith says. 
his eyes lit with hunger and excitement. If the pitch gets cold and hardens, it won't trap them. Hopefully they won't be frightened by the fire, I say. Just the thought of roasting ptarmigan meat lights my mind and makes the juices in my cheeks water. Actually, Seth says, our biggest problem is Zoe. He's off hunting, but if he comes back, no ptarmigan will come near. Seth sets up his trap at the back end of the sack near the fire. He's threaded a bendy willow switch through the sleeve where the drawstring used to be. He's placed another willow switch circle in the bottom. These two hoops hold the bag open. Seth scatters a handful of needles and catkins on the snow near the opening of the bag. My brothers pull me away from the fire and we wait at a distance of about 20 yards for ptarmigan. Keith keeps whispering things like, we have to be ready to seize the bag if one goes in. And the ripped bag is weak, and even with sticky feathers, the ptarmigan might be able to work its way out pretty quickly until Seth shush hushes him. We stand, eyes pinned on the ratty bag, waiting and waiting. Keith el elbows me hard when a speckled ptarmigan hops into view. It skitters across the snow to the bag and looks inside. I hold my breath. The bird pecks at the bait scattered in front of the bag. When this is gone, it pokes its beak into the bag opening. The fire pops and the ptarmigan hops a few feet away turns and stares at the bag and then hops back. At that moment, somewhere in the not-too-distant forest, Zoe howls. The ptarmigan scares off to a nearby tree branch. Keith groans and starts to talk, but Seth swats him and places a forefinger against his mouth. As I strain to hear... Oh, as I strain my ears, listening for the sound of Zoe returning, I worry that we're losing precious travel time by indulging Seth's scheme. All at once, the ptarmigan flaps down off the branch, hops to the bag, pushes inside to get the seeds and catkins. Seth sprints. He grabs the bag by its opening. The willow twig loop makes it hard to close up the top, and the bird flaps against the inside of the flimsy fabric. Seth fumbles, and the bag falls to the snow. Get it, Keith shouts. You do it, Seth yells back. The ptarmigan is vocalizing and thrashing. Keith runs and snatches the bag. He manages to shake the bird down to the bottom and closes his fist around the fabric, just below the top willow loop. What now? We all know what now. We also know that, even though we're starving, neither I nor Seth can do it. Keith walks the bag over to a tree trunk. He swings the bag to the side with all his force. I look away, but can't help hearing the dull thud of the bird hitting the tree trunk. When I look back, the bag is motionless. We are still, too, for a moment, realizing the miracle of breakfast. I send up a chair and do a little dance right there in the snow. When I stop twirling, I see, sitting in a tree branch not ten feet from me, another charm again. This one must be extra dumb because even my cheering and twirling hasn't startled it. I take a rock from my pocket, cock back my arm, and fire. The rock hits the bird right in the head. It falls to the ground. Keith! I can't bear to touch the scaly little legs or feel the oily feathers. Get it! Here comes Zoe, running at full speed, headed for the Seth. When he sees the fallen bird, he changes course. Zoe and Keith arrive at the same time on either side of the stunned but not dead ptarmigan. The wolf pup closes his jaws around the feathered bulk. Keith backs up, looking over his shoulder at us. Seth runs to his pup. He crouches down and says, Drop it, as if the wolf were a trained house dog. Don't, I cry out as Seth reaches for the ptarmigan, still in Zoe's jaws. Coming between a wolf and meat is as dangerous as coming between a brown bear, sow, and her cub. Even from where I stand, I can see Seth and Zoe gazing into each other's eyes. Zoe widens his jaws and lets the ptarmigan fall to the snow. He backs up several steps and lowers his tummy to the ground, his paws stretched out in front. He whines. Thanks, Zoe, Keith says, and he picks up the twitching bird. To his brother, he says, it's not dead yet. Keith hands the bag to ptarmigan to me and takes the stunned one dangling from Seth's hands. A moment later, it too is dead. Good boy, Seth says to Zoe, and scratches the pup behind the ears. It takes us well over an hour to pluck the birds. My hands shake from hunger, but we work next to the fire so we're warm enough. I make sure we have very sharp, sturdy sticks for roasting. We can't afford to lose a single morsel. I let the boys choose the parts they want. Keith starts with a leg, Seth with breast meat, and I spear another hunk of breast meat. I hold the stick over the fire and listen to the sizzle and hiss as the meat browns. My stomach wrenches with hunger, and it takes a lot of willpower to not eat it raw, but the wait is worth it. The roast ptarmigan is succulent and flavorful. 
We lick our fingers. We scrape our teeth along the bones. Then we break the bones and suck out the marrow. I even sneak a bit of roasted meat to Zoe. Strength courses into my arms and legs. My brain feels as if it's been turned on again. You guys are awesome, I say. You too, Keith says. Yeah, you too, Seth agrees. I figure this is a good time to tell them about my mistake. I explain that we floated down the wrong stream and that we're going to have to go back. I brace myself for their reaction, but with meat in their stomachs, the boys take the news in stride. They wade upstream in the shallow creek, their high rubber boots keeping their feet dry, dragging the raft. I wade behind, pushing, and Zoe trots along the shore. We reach Sweet Creek by early afternoon. We climb on board with Zoe and begin floating once again. Not even an hour later, we come to the confluence of a much larger tributary. This, I am sure, is the Aurora Creek turnoff. I look around to get our bearings. Sweet Creek spills into the bigger waterway. Both streams slate gray, a few shades darker than the sky. I can practically see the ice crystals in the air. The water is a degree or two warmer than slush. The surrounding trees hold their loads of snow from last night's dump. From this intersection... I can't see any mountains at all, and I miss them. Their stalwart show of strength. It's just dark, flowing water, endless snowy forest, and the three of us. And that is the end of chapter 12. Let me see how long. Oh, 13 is very short, so I'm going to keep going. Since we're only into 11 minutes. So chapter 13, here we go. Despite its name, Aurora Creek is wide, fast-moving, and deep. Our raft swirls in the churning mix of currents at the meeting of the two waterways. I jab the steering pole, trying to gain purchase, but it no longer reaches the bottom. The current sucks us right out into the deep flow. We speed along at the mercy of the rushing water. Good, I say to the boys, nice and fast. We'll be at Fort Yukon soon. Soon, Seth says, his voice reedy with worry. I look into the distance as if I can almost see the town. The sun is low. A flock of geese fly overhead in a V formation. Their wings flap against... The deepening sky. If we don't stop for the night, we'll get there faster. How will we know when we're there? It's a town. There'll be lights. Seth puzzles what this looks like. Keith says, but how will we even get the raft to shore? I'm saved from answering this question by a faint rumbling. The sound scares me at first, as if the earth itself is letting out a low growl. Motion in the sky over the trees to the east catches my eye. A helicopter. My mind skids on the enormity of what this means. Helicopter means people. People means rescue. The chopper changes course and heads in our direction. The pilot has spotted us. For a moment, the idea of being rescued, being safe, fills me with relief. But what if it's Dad? He probably would have left the moment he got back from hunting. He would have rode all night, not even stopping to sleep. He may well have passed us up while we were sidetracked on the wrong stream. He could have gotten to Fort Yukon ahead of us. We are dead center in the pilot's sights. Three children and a wolf pup coursing along on a rustic raft in the middle of a swift river. Dad might be looking at us through a pair of binoculars right now. When the helicopter is almost overhead, the pilot banks the chopper so it flies almost sideways. It, he's dropped so low that the wind off the propeller blows our hair. The boys huddle on our raft. Keith with his hands over his head and Seth with his face buried in Zoe's neck fur. But I kneel, my head craned back, and gape at the people in the chopper. It's not Dad. Besides the pilot, there are two passengers, a man and a woman, both wearing knit hats and big parkas. They look like a couple of flight-seeing tourists. They point and stare at us. I know the international signal of distress, standing and waving my arms up and down. The pilot would be obliged to call the authorities in Fort Yukon. A rescue team would be dispatched. They'd give us food. I could see a doctor about my bleeding. Tonight, we'd sleep in beds. My brothers would be safe, and we'd be returned to Dad's custody. He'd take us back to the cabin on Sweet Creek, with his drinking, anger, and fought, failing dream, and the long, dark days of winter. I stand up and give the pilot the A-OK -okay sign by making a circle with my thumb and forefinger, the other three fingers splayed up. I force a smile and wave him off, communicating that we're just three Alaskan kids out on the lark. Sure enough, he banks his helicopter and flies off toward the interior. I check the boys' faces to see if they're okay with this decision. Keith clenches his shoulders and touches the bruised place on his jaw. He'll hurt Zoe, Seth says, understanding my silent question. I want pizza, Keith says. Okay, then, I say. 
New York, here we come. And that was just about three more minutes. So let's see how long chapter 14 is. Now this is actually a short one too. I think I'm going to do one more. All right, so chapter 14. What if the pilot radios back to town, Seth asks. We're in plain sight on the river if someone comes looking. He won't though, I say. I signaled that we're fine. We're fine, Keith barks as if repeating it will make it so. But if Dad reports us missing, Seth is right. We're so obvious rafting down these this river. But it's by far the fastest way to travel, and without food and shelter, we need fast. I interrupt the questions by singing in a loud voice, Pull, pull, pull your raft gently down the stream. The boys gawk at me and then glance at each other. Dad taught us to sing the original version of the song when we first arrived at Sweet Creek and he was building our rowboat. I point at Seth when I get to Merrily, and he shrugs and joins in with pull, pull, pull. Next, I point to Keith, who is wearing his fiercest scowl, but he surprises me by also joining in at the right place. We sing the round three times. Next, I start in on one of Mama's favorite songs, Red River Valley. The boys don't know this one. Dad wouldn't want me to sing it around him, but I remember all the words perfectly. They learn the verses and tune quickly, and we sing it through twice. Down by the banks of the hanky-panky, Keith suggests, and Seth sings the first lines by himself. Down by the banks of the hanky-panky, where the bullfrogs jump from bank to banky. Right on top of the small raft, speeding along the river, Seth tries to get up to do the hops and claps that go with the song. He falls back down and even Keith laughs. Just as we start in on the second verse, a loud creak interrupts our singing. A sharp crack follows as one of the raft's outer deck planks pops up off the foundation logs. Seth wiggles the plank with the toe of his boot. This board is wonky. The nails are rusted. Worse, Keith says. Two of the foundation logs are separating. We all stare at the wobbly plank and then at the widening gap between the planks as the raft slides into a rougher patch of the river. The wavelets bounce us along until an eddy snatches the raft and swirls it in a swift circle. The plank and logs loosen even more. I quickly check how far we are from the riverbank. Too far. Deck, Seth recites. Hull, bow, stern, oars, rudder. What are you talking about, Keith says. Back when Dad was building our rowboat, Willa showed us that picture in the encyclopedia that named all the parts of a boat. I'm surprised Seth remembers this, but Keith lights up. Yes, if we had a rudder, we could use it to steer the raft to shore. I grip the bad plank and wag it back and forth like a loose tooth until I am able to yank it off the logs. Even better than a rudder, I say, a paddle. As the bad side of the raft starts to sink, we drag our packs to the high side. Zoe barks at the water as if he can scare it away like he did the bear. I nail on the tipped deck and dig the plank into the water. Pulling hard, we slide a bit toward the riverbank. I stab my makeshift paddle back into the water and pull again. All three of us, our packs and the pup, crowd the high end of the raft. Again and again, I plunge the plank into the river and pull as hard and fast as possible. When the, when the raft sinks farther into the river, Zoe leaps into the water and swims to shore. He shakes himself off and yips his encouragement. My knees feel like they're breaking. My arms and back strain with the paddling but it's working. We're within striking distance of shore. Keith jabs the steering pole into the river and hits bottom. Seth starts singing, pull, pull, pull your raft, as Keith pushes with all his might. But a counter current grabs the raft and pulls it back out toward the center of the stream. All my work is about to be lost with one swift play by the river. Foundation logs separate even more as another plank pops loose. Keith rips off his parka and hauls off his boots and jeans. No, I bellow. You can't swim, Seth yells. Keith slides into the river, keeping his hands on what's left of the raft. He pants for breath as the frigid water seizes his thin torso. Holding on with both hands, he manages to work his way around to the back. From there, he kicks his skinny legs. I paddle with the board. Seth pushes with the pole, quietly singing. My feet are touching bottom, Keith yells a few more seconds later. He pushes us the rest of the way to shore. Seth and I toss the packs as well as Keith's boots and clothes 
onto land and jump off the raft. Keith collapses in the mud like a half-dead muskrat. His long underwear is soaked and he's shivering hard. As he tries to stand, his legs buckle. Quick, I say to Seth. We each support a side of Keith, holding him up by the armpits. Into the trees. Once we get off the riverbank into the forest, while we'll be out of sight, we drop Keith on a dry patch under a tree. Fire, I tell Seth, as fast as you can. I hustle back down to the water's edge. Hesitating only a moment, I put a foot on what's left of the raft and give it a shove into the river. It drifts and spins on the current. With any luck, it'll sink soon. There'll be no sign of us whatsoever if the chopper pilot contacts any authorities in Fort Yukon. I pick up our stuff and, stumbling over the shoreline rocks, carry everything up to the forest. Keith is shivering violently. As Seth kneels to light the kindling he's gathered, I strip off my pants and long underwear and quickly put my pants back on. Keith takes off his wet clothes and puts on my dry long underwear. I spread out the tattered plastic tarp and throw our zipped up together sleeping bags on top. While Seth builds up the fire, I climb into the sleeping bag pouch with Keith so my body heat can warm him up. After about 30 minutes, Keith stops shivering and starts talking, recounting the details of his swim. I take the cooking pot to the river, fill it, and then tuck this next to the fire. Soon we're all drinking hot water to warm us up. It's almost dark and I'm too exhausted to build another snow fort, so I get back into the sleeping bags with Keith and Seth joins us. You said you'd tell us the ending to Jane Eyre, Seth says, amazing me that he can think of stories at a time like this. She almost died, my voice is weak and hoarse. She wandered around in the wilderness, hungry, tired, and cold, but she never compromised on doing what she knew was right. I wait for one of the boys to ask, what is right? But we all pass out. And that is the end of chapter 14. And I'm going to end it there because we're at 21 minutes. And I'll see you for chapter 15 in the next video. Thanks for listening. Ciao for now. Mwah.